Hello everyone who is watching. We've got lots and lots of people signed up. So hopefully all of those people have joined to watch this event live. Obviously you can also watch it afterwards, but if you're here, you're watching live. Um, this is Labourless latest event in collaboration with UK in a changing Europe. So we're putting on a series of events looking at different aspects of the Labour Party under the new leadership, its engagement with Brexit we had, uh, we're going to have stuff about the Constitution, and today we are talking about Labour's new economic strategy. So we're going to be focusing on how it's different from the Tory strategy, how it can cut through to voters, those kind of issues. Now, Keir Starmer obviously delivered this really big speech last week on the economy, he announced two new policies. He's talking about a British COVID recovery bond, which would allow savers to kind of have a stake in our recovery. And he announced more funding for business startup loans as a proposal as well. Uh, he also talked generally of just how Tory ideology has weakened the UK economy before the crisis. So not only how it's handled to COVID poorly, but also what it did in the years preceding that. And it's, it's quite similar to what Annalise has been talking about in terms of the importance of resilience. So making sure our public services are well funded, people aren't just living on the brink and kind of talking about that as well as talking about value for money. So people often say at the moment that this is quite a difficult time for Labour on the economy because Rishi Sunak has been spending loads of money during this crisis and he's done unprecedented things like the furlough scheme. And others think that actually that shifting consensus is an, is an advantage for the left and for the Labour Party. So these are the kind of things that we're going to talk about in our panel tonight, which I think are really interesting. Um, I'm first of all just going to put a question of my own to each person as a kind of overview to our brilliant panel but we've also got this slido uh, tool which means that everyone watching can put in questions and vote up questions that they like and then i can read those questions out and direct them to particular panel members as well so if you want to specify that that would be really helpful so first of all we've got annalisa dodds she is of course labor's shadow chancellor of the exchequer and an mp the mp for oxford East, and she used to be an MEP. So Annalisa, would you like to just kick us off by giving us a quick sort of three minute overview of how Labour is now approaching economic policy and giving us an idea of how that new strategy is different from the approach that the Tories are taking in government? Well, th thanks so much, Sienna. It's really good to be here with you and with Jonathan and Miata as well and everybody in the audience. Really terrific to have been invited. And I think, first of all, our approach to economic um, policy must start with where our country is right now. The fact that we've had the worst economic crisis of any major economy, as well as some of the worst health outcomes as well. And that hasn't happened by accident. It wasn't fated that our country would end up in this position. It doesn't reflect you know, the work of our incredible key workers. It doesn't reflect the achievements of our scientists. It reflects the fact that we've seen our public services progressively ha having a reduction in their resilience over the last 10 years, as we've all seen. But we've also seen a massive reduction in the resilience of our economy as well. We entered the crisis with a quarter of families not having £100 in the bank, with enormous gaps in productivity growth across our country, with investment having been low for a very long time and with one of the longest squeezes on living standards that we've seen for many, many generations, for eight generations. So we entered this period in a very weak state. Labour's response has got to be for the future to see how we would rebuild strong foundations into the future, how we would have that uh, really strong recovery that we need to see, one which will deliver security for families and communities and build the jobs of the future. We must build that resilience. We know this crisis, unfortunately, will likely not be the only one that will impact on us. We may see future pandemics, but we have the climate crisis as well affecting us right now. So we need to see radical change and change that must build that security for families and communities across the country. Brilliant, that was very speedy. Thank you very much. Um, so next I'm gonna to go to Jonathan. This is Professor Jonathan Portez, and he's a senior fellow at UK in a changing Europe. And I'm just going to start off by asking you, what's your assessment of this new strategy adopted by Labour? Do you think the new leadership here is on the right track? And do you think it will help to rebuild trust with voters on the economy? 
Uh, I think um, that the broad approach um, makes a certain amount of sense. I mean, the consensus on fiscal policy, debt and deficits has clearly shifted um, completely from 10 years ago. And I really think it's important for um, Labour and indeed um, progressive economists in general to sort of bank that and to make sure to, you know, uh, um, to just keep on going on about it. Um, you know, you, in politics, one always forgets that, that people don't actually pay that much attention most of the time, which is quite reasonable. So I think to keep on going until people are sick to death of hearing about it, saying those economists um, and those politicians who opposed austerity were right. Um, it left us, we didn't fix the roof while the sun is shining, quite the opposite. Um, we put ourselves, and I agree with Annalise on this, that the lack of resilience, that by trying to cut an extra point or two off the deficit, we left our public services, our welfare state, um, unprepared for this crisis. Um, and we must not make that mistake ever again. You know, um, I, I would place more emphasis just on repeating that than on, than on de developing detailed policies. And the other, uh, um, the other big thing, though, I think, which is slightly missing at the moment, is what are the policies designed to um, redress structural inequalities. And I think here it's important that, um, that, that Labour or indeed all people on the progressive side broaden things out from saying, look, left being left behind or, or inequality is not just about the red wall or about some communities. Inequalities are much greater within regions than they are between regions. Child poverty, as we know, is higher in London than anywhere else. I'm um, not to say that London is the priority either, but that the structural inequalities in this country um, by above all class and educational background and the wealth of your parents, but then on top of that, of course, um, uh, gender, um, ethnicity, and so on. Those are what actually we need to do something about it. How exactly is Labour going to do something about it? What is Labour going to do, for example, about the Uber ruling yesterday and the response there? Um, though, you know, so having an actual, and, and there I think again, there is very clearly clear blue water with others, with a government that really has no interest in enforcing rules in the labor market, as far as one can see. So, but I think, what, you know, it really is important to worry much more about the big picture and the big messaging and specific policies at, at, at this point. Um, but those two, I think, um, you know, that austerity not only is dead, but must be buried permanently with the state for its heart. And the task now is to redress those structural inequalities. So that seems to me to be the central messaging that is required. Brilliant, thank you so much. Now I'm gonna turn to Mieta Fanbule, who's obviously the chief executive of the highly influential New Economics Foundation. Thank you so much for joining as well. What's your take on Labour's economic strategy at the moment? Would you agree with the, the kind of points that Jonathan was making? And, and do you think that things are easier now for Labour now because the kind of top institutions and, and Tories are denouncing austerity, even if you know there's an argument that the government is still implementing it in some ways? Or does that actually make things more difficult for Labour? What do you think? So I think where Labour are on the money is their kind of problem definition, their analysis of the kind of the state of the nation. Um, the crisis, I think, has exposed uh, huge structural problems with the economy um, and critically not just exposed the fact that we've had a squeeze in living standards, uh, the fact that some of our most valuable workers are paid poverty wages, uh, the fact that we've massively denuded our social protection, whether that's through public services or that's through our social security system. I think it's blown all of that up and exposed it in glaring lights for everyone to see. But critically, I think it's also forged a consensus that there has to be change. Um, and that's where I think there's the opportunity. There's no longer a dividing line about the need for kind of big structural change. Um, the question now is actually which side has the answers to deliver that. Uh, so where I think the ground is easy um, is that, you know, the worry always is, if you like, uh, the Conservatives were always the kind of party of stability. Labour was always the party of change and progress. And there was a point where it felt that change and progress was scary for the public. But I think the public, all the polling suggests that the public want change and something to be better 
you know, to use Keir's phrase, no one wants a return back to business as usual. And then all the mainstream institutions are galvanizing around that. So whether you're talking about the Bank of England, uh, you know, through to the likes of the IFS, everyone is saying, actually, we need this to be a pivotal moment of change. The big question is the how. Um, and I think this speaks uh, to Labour. I think there's an opportunity there because I think Labour can do change better than any other party. You look at its long history, uh, but, but critically, actually, the, the space for change. Uh, so whether it's the debate around the efficacy of the state intervening to make people's lives better, to make the economy better. The pandemic has shown us that actually the state can work in ways to make people's lives better. I think that speaks to the lab to Labour's agenda. I think the second piece uh, for me is, uh, you know, the, the question of how we transition economies that does the job of both lifting living standards, but also greening the economy. Um, and again, uh, you know, I think this speaks to Labour's potential agenda. Um, and then critically, we are, as you know, Jonathan says, the debate around austerity, I think, uh, has moved on leaps and bounds. And that creates a new space for us to talk about how do you invest well? You know, what does that look like? How do you build a social settlement out of this, you know? And I think there is consensus um, and, you know, fair play to the government. They have done extraordinary things over the last year. But by doing those extraordinary things, they have torn up the mainstream. You know, they have shown that the impossible is possible in moments of crisis. And I would argue that, you know, a living standard squeeze that's lasted a decade, that's about to be uh, compounded over the next five years, the climate emergency, are equally big crises that require big interventions. Uh, so I think the landscape speaks to labour. The challenge now is directional travel is clear, consensus around change is clear, what's the prospectus that can deliver that? And in the end, I think the election will be won by which party has the better story to tell about how they make the country better. Thank you so much. So I've got lots and lots of questions already coming up. So that's great. And remember to um, put a little thumbs up on the questions that you think are particularly important because we've got over 50 now. But if you can put thumbs up to things that might have already been asked, that'd be great. So one person said, uh, Rich and Holt is asking about the two policies that I mentioned from last week. So this one I'm gonna direct towards Annalisa. So she might give a little bit more insight into those policies. So a COVID recovery bond and support for startups. Why a COVID bond when the gilt market already exists? What's the difference he's asking? And also why startups? What's the empirical evidence that helping these would do much for economic growth? So if Annalisa would like to just start off by explaining a bit more about those. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks very much to Richard for those questions. I mean, first of all, you know, we appreciate that there are a variety of different ways that people can invest their money currently. And this isn't about providing, for example, stronger returns for individuals. You know, we recognise that actually during this crisis, there have been more people who have lost income than have been able to save. So this is not a regressive measure, it's a progressive one. What we've actually seen happening over recent weeks and some really interesting evidence coming out about this uh, just over the last few days is that actually quite large numbers of people who have been able to save are putting some of that money, for example, into different forms of property. They're using it to fund additional homes and so on and so forth. Now, that isn't building that additional productive capacity and the kind of transition that we need to see for the future. Richard is right, it is possible to invest in guilt, but I think if you asked most individuals whether they would be able to do that, they wouldn't view that as a possibility for them. If instead there was a scheme set up through NSNI, as Labour suggested last week, as Keir suggested last week, which was readily available to people that would be secure, that people trusted, that would enable them to actually use their savings to support our recovery, to build on that national spirit then that could be a really strong way of helping to support our recovery, but also helping people to keep their money secure. Um, we think it would be capitalising on that spirit of solidarity that we've seen in evidence during this crisis and that it would have some prudential benefits as well because of what I said about people uh, looking to put some of those savings into, uh, into property currently rather than other forms of investment. Secondly, around startups, I mean, we know that currently actually there's a very uneven picture 
across the country. Um, that when it comes to, for example, existing use of the startup loan scheme, that that's very regionally variable, that we don't see the kind of support for people setting up new businesses right across the country that we desperately need. And actually, it is important that we get new businesses set up. We need to ensure that the conditions are there so that we can have that growth right across the country, taking on new workers as they grow. And so that's where the startup policy came from. But I would say that's not the only element of what Labour is setting out, obviously. First, we need to make sure that existing businesses can persevere. We need the government to change course very quickly around that. There's a number of elements of that. We might come back to it later in the discussion. We also need to stop debt being a huge pressure, particularly on small businesses. So we need to have a much more sensible approach to the debt they've taken on during this period. We've set out, for example, for the bounce back loan, so-called, how it should be possible for small companies to be paying those back as they make profit. Uh, so um, that's where those two policies are, are coming from that Keir announced last week. Well, on that point, Annalisa, I was just going to ask you what you thought of uh, John McDonnell over the weekend proposed a windfall tax to, to go towards cancelling personal debt because that's such a big problem at the moment. What do you think about those kind of solutions? Well, we've certainly seen, unfortunately, the big gulf in taxation, especially between businesses based in bricks and mortar and those based in clicks and the internet. We've seen that gulf becoming increasingly evident and frankly crass during this period. We've seen how some companies have been able to make very significant profits while others are struggling so much. I think actually there's a variety of ways of tackling this. You know, we've continuously focused on that divergence between the impact of business rates compared to a corporation tax regime, which is absolutely full of holes where we've seen rampant tax avoidance for so long, something that I've pushed on time and time and time again. But also this is about when it comes to providing support for business, not entrenching those gulfs. So for example, you know, Labour Run Wales said from the beginning that their business rates holiday wouldn't be provided for the very biggest essential retailers, those enormous uh, supermarket chains that did make really big profits, that instead that money would be focused on smaller businesses. So that's what we've been calling for as well. You know, we do need to recognise that while some businesses have done very, very well during this crisis, of course, many, many others have really struggled and we need the system to reflect that. Jonathan, I'm going to come to you next. What do you think about the kind of policies that um, Labour has announced recently, including those ones from the, the speech last week? And what do you think about kind of the need that some people say Labour does need to identify who would be the kind of winners and losers from its economic strategy that it's proposing ahead of the next election? Um, so, uh, I mean, I think, frankly, um, the uh, the recovery bond is essentially a political rather than economic device. As the questioner said, we have got a gilt market. We already have national savings. Um, you could uh, you could just, you know, if, if you want a, a, a bond at a particular interest rate to finance things, um, sold direct to individuals, you can do that through national savings. Um, um, I think you know there is an argument for it um, as a way of of perhaps uh, um, you know giving people something to latch on to, particularly those people who have uh, you know like perhaps many of at least some of those uh, on this call and and in the audience who've actually been able to work from home um, and are feeling that we would like to express solidarity with people who've been less lucky during the pandemic, um, but but it's not going to be transformative and. Uh, new funds for business startups is something that all governments do all the time. And again, you know, again, I have no problem with it, but it's not transformative. I do think not necessarily now, because I think now it is the big picture rather than poli policies that matter. Um, there does need to be some discussion of what uh, um, uh, of who the winners and losers are. You cannot um, tackle inequalities without engaging in that. Um, and I certainly think uh, onto the, the issue of a windfall tax that um, rebalancing the tax system towards those who can afford it, but it's not just, and that is partly business, but it is also higher income individuals and higher wealth in, individuals and getting ahead of trying to work out what a sensible um, tax system that taxes wealth more um, and that taxes businesses 
uh, that, uh, um, that like, like Amazon and so on that have done very well and will that was continue to do it very well. Um, that work does need to start now, even if policies themselves don't necessarily need to be pinned down as yet. Mietta, would you like to, to react to those policies and kind of what Jonathan was saying, but also our most popular question that's come in so far from Jack Churchill. He asks, what do you, how do you compress the economic strategy into a format that those who aren't chewed into politics will both understand and hear about? So that's kind of about communications as well. Yeah, very good question. Uh, so I think on uh, the policies, so I, I, I sort of shared Jonathan's sentiment. I think in terms of solving the investment problem, you know, when interest rates that you can borrow, uh, you know, from the market at negative or, or zero interest rates, that's probably a more efficient way uh, for the state to do it. But I think the bond proposal is trying to do more than just raise capital. It's trying to tap into the fact that, you know, there will potentially be somewhere upwards of 250 billion of savings that people are sitting on um, and that they're thinking about how they deploy. Um, but it also is trying to tap into that sense of collective solidarity, you know, that we are all part of the recovery effort. You know, the thing that struck me with what Keir was saying was that 1945 moment, the sense that we have a collective project and that we're all trying to do our bit in order to regear and to rebuild the country. And I think that's its appeal. I, I think that the, the sense that we can all be part of that endeavor, that people who can, can contribute. And actually through their contribution, yes, they get a return, uh, but, but more importantly, they're lifting up their communities. And that's really powerful in a world where actually we haven't always talked about the collective and solidarity and community. So I think it's important for that as well. Um, I, I, I would say that, you know, if I had to uh, choose the Labour policy that I think is the most powerful, I think it's the one it's been banging on about uh, a kind of green fiscal stimulus, like that would be a game changer. Um, and it speaks to the here and now, but you know, 30 billion, uh, and we've done the analysis that would unlock about 400,000 green jobs and could potentially unlock green jobs over the course of the next two years when unemployment has risen by a million, it's huge. But it also speaks to the scale of ambition you need to, if you are gonna do both the job of trans positioning uh, the economy towards low carbon, but critically building up communities. Uh, you can imagine combining those two things um, in order to do both, you know, to use the government's word, leveling up um, as well as greening. Uh, and that's the scale of ambition we need to see from the government, quite frankly, but also really encouraging, encouraging that that's the sort of ideas that uh, Labour is sort of advocating and pushing out. In terms of the cell, which, you know, the, the difficulty uh, as a sort of walk, <laughs> uh, economics is, is, is hard to <laughs> make sexy and sell in a compelling way. Uh, but I do think, you know, for me, the sort of three hooks are a 1945 moment for change. Um, I, I think that appeals and can resonate. And I think if you combine that with, you know, three propositions, one is, the settlement for people has to be better. You know, we've got to, the settlement that actually, you know, survived long after the post-war period has been massively fractured and communities are feeling it and people are feeling it. And there has to be a new settlement coming out of this. Um, and, you know, that should speak to what we call living income. You know, everyone should have the basics to afford a decent, dignified quality of life. You know, that, that's not beyond the wit <laughs> of the sixth richest country in the world. Um, uh, you know, combined with a basket of services that's there to protect people, to ensure that cradle foot to grave, uh, they have the foundations in order to have to live well lives. You know, that, that's the kind of basic thing that people want. They want health. They want to know their kids are going to be educated. They want housing. Again, this should not be on the be with beyond the wits um, of you know of, of a rich country to deliver. And then you combine that with a story about how we can breathe life into our communities as we try and transition to low carbon. Like those are hooks that I think speak to the reality of people's lives and translates economic jargon into things that just feels exciting bold but just necessary <laughs> like I think it's just necessary I don't think there's any doubt that Miata is a, a policy wonk she was talking about diminishing returns earlier and like a just very casual conversation about working from home which made me laugh um I'm gonna turn to another one that's always a really popular one with our events because of course it is UK and a changing Europe um Stephen has asked, is it possible to have a credible economic strategy without acknowledging damage done by Brexit? I'm going to turn to Jonathan first, and then I'll go to you, Annalisa, because I'm sure you'd like to slightly question the premise of the question as well. Um, 
Um, no, it's not. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that the damage done by Brexit is the main issue here, except as a jumping off point to what is Labour's policy about um, relations with the European Union. Um, you know, is the, uh, um, is, is the Labour Party going to try and renegotiate the terms of the relationship so as to reduce the economic damage which is otherwise likely to accrue and if so what are the trade-offs involved there um you know and, and there are trade-offs involved there is the labor part is labor prepared to stand up and say yes we want to seek something that looks much closer to a norway or swiss style relationship and we recognize um, that will mean signing up to some things. That will mean that we will not have the freedom to diverge if we want to call it that in certain areas. Um, but given that the sorts of divergence that are being talked, are being talked about may be, in Labour's view at any rate, mostly negative, we don't think those, that, that, that freedom is worth it. Um, we think that, the, the, you know, um, jobs and growth are more important. Is Labour going to make that a, a, a argument or not? I mean, you know, that, that is a choice which has to be made at some point. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, um, I think simply saying, well, Brexit is done, we can't do anything about it, is not a viable option because the relationship will evolve, will change over the next few years anyway. Labour will need a policy going into the next election. I personally don't think that simply saying, well, this agreement is just fine, we don't prepare, propose to change it, it, it's good enough. But in any, even if it was, the question still needs to be answered, in my view. Annalisa, would you like to, to kind of respond to that? There's lots of questions along the lines of why isn't Labour talking about Brexit more? Well, of course, there, I mean, there are core elements of the deal which are still not sorted out. So it's definitely not the case that this is completely finished now at all. If you look at, for example, financial services, obviously I cover that area as Shadow Chancellor. You know, in theory, we're meant to be seeing a memorandum of, of un, sorry, memorandum of understanding, bit of a mouthful, uh, being produced by the UK government and the EU 27. No indication of what is likely to be in there. We've been told that there will be no running commentary around that memorandum. And yet, ultimately, having uh, you know, trades between the UK and the EU 27 in that area is very, very important to our economy. You know, financial and related professional services support one in 14 jobs in the UK. And actually, the way to ensure that we can continue that trade is by sending very strong signals that the UK is not going to be seeking to undercut regulation that operates in the EU 27, that instead we have a shared interest in having high standards when it comes to, for example, consumer protection, but also high standards when it comes to financial stability as well and transparency. So we do need to be focused on, on those elements which are, are still not even agreed within the terms of the, the existing deal. But then of course we need to focus on how we can really promote our domestic businesses into the future, you know, particularly for those that rely on uh, just-in-time manufacturing and very rapid um, uh, uh, trading across borders, very complex trading across borders. Of course, that is going to be more difficult with the deal that we've been presented with. Now, that means that we must have a very strong approach from government, which is focused on boosting domestic supply chains, doing all that it can to make sure that those businesses in industries, particularly within manufacturing, have the support that they will need in order to be able to compete for the future. You know, I do think there are big opportunities here that the UK can seize, you know, particularly around automotive, for example, where we've got very productive sector. But if we continue as we've been, where we haven't had a strong industrial strategy, despite what government has said in the past, then I think we do risk having a lot of damage to some of those industries into the future. Yeta, would you like to come in and just sort of give your view on what you think Labour should be talking about in relation to Brexit? So uh, I, I think the Brexit debate is done uh, and I don't think it's uh, helpful to be trying to rehash it. Um, and actually the technicalities around Brexit, quite frankly, the public just completely goes over their heads. Where I do think that there is space um, that Labour should be occupying is, you know, 
Brexit wasn't just about leaving. It was about making people's lives better. And I find it quite interesting that there is almost a kind of post hoc rationalization. No, it wasn't about making people's lives better. It was just about sovereignty and leaving. Um, and, and I think that has to be called out. Um, and in the end, the, you know, the, the debate in the country is, this pathway was supposed to make people, particularly those people that voted in their hordes to leave, lives better. Now, I don't believe that the deal has, that's been set up is gonna do that. And actually the more that can be exposed um, as fundamentally the failing of the project rather than Brexit itself, like in five years time, the only exam question was, we left and was our lives better? I suspect that, you know, on the other side, the hope is that COVID and everything to do with COVID just eclipses Brexit. So actually some of the Brexit impacts on our economy get lost within the COVID impacts. And we all forget that, you know, Brexit was either a success or not a success. But I would keep the debate on that. And for me, the real worry is that we set us at, at the very time where we had this huge challenge anyway, living the standards crisis, climate change, throw in COVID. That was already that already hard. You then chuck in Brexit that's made it that bit harder. And like that is the litmus test. Um, and that's the thing that I think Labour can and should be coming back to. It's the outcome it was supposed to deliver and how far, well, you know, maybe I'm wrong. And maybe in five years time, we look back and it'll be a roaring success. But it's how far we've traveled in that promise to make people's lives better. Um, and if the government hasn't done that, then it ought and it must be held to account for that. Okay, I'm going to go to the, the next most popular question that we've had come in so far. So Alan John Carter asks, climate change is the greatest challenge ever faced by humanity. Where does this come in to Labour's economic strategy? And Lisa, if you'd like to start on that. Well, I wouldn't say that it just comes in or intrudes. It's actually fundamental to what Labour's economic strategy must achieve. Because we know, and I, I referred to this at, at the beginning, um, we know that the biggest crisis ultimately that's already upon us, that's already damaging our critical infrastructure is the climate crisis, that we have to take action. It's obviously a moral imperative, but it's very clearly an economic one as well. I'm sure I'm not telling anybody on this call anything that we didn't already know in spades. We've known that since the Stern report, but we are still not acting like there is a genuine climate emergency. Of course, the UK Parliament agreed that there was after Labour pressure, but we still do not act in that way. Things must change and radically. I um, very much agree with what Miata said about the need for um, a green stimulus. Obviously, we set out our plans, the Green Economic uh, Recovery Report, focused on pulling forward capital spending into 18 months. Uh, we believe that if you did that with £30 billion of capital spending, then you could support the creation of 400,000 jobs right across the UK, but you could also do an enormous amount to make our housing far more energy efficient, to build the new industries of the future, support existing industries to decarbonise, um, and really to do so much that's necessary so that we can also, not, not just in relation to the climate crisis, but so that we can also really promote um, the natural uh, uh, world as well and make sure that we um, really are protecting biodiversity in our country. So it is about investment. It's also about, I would say, the very processes of government in their entirety. But particularly from my point of view as Shadow Chancellor, it means we must take what I call a green pen to all of government spending decisions. Again, we're not acting like there's an emergency. So you still see budget items going through with no consideration of whether they uh, contribute to the goal of net zero, actually inhibit it. I think that means that far too often governments just think that they can wait until a time very far in the future and take decisions right now that are bad for our environment because they'll just be able to offset them later. Well, I'm afraid that is not how the climate crisis works. We need that action to take place now. So, as I say, it's absolutely fundamental to Labour's economic uh, strategy, as well as all the other elements of our operation, of course, as a Labour Party. On the same theme, uh, Jonathan, I've had a question from Joanne who says, to you in particular, how does Labour get the message across that there's no trade-off between getting our economy going and tackling inequality in the climate crisis? Well, I think that uh, the, um, the, the austerity argument debate, which we referred to earlier, I hope um, helps, to, uh, uh, um, helps to make that. Um, but I think 
uh, the, the, the key there is just to emphasize that, that um, you know, perhaps to build on the analogy of the pandemic, one thing that I think economists, and indeed economists who, who uh, um, you know, even, even libertarian and, and very much more market-oriented economists than are present on the panel tonight, um, have actually, I think, been very good about saying, no, there is not a trade-off between health and the economy during a pandemic. In fact, um, stopping, you know, um, con containing and suppressing the virus is a precondition to a proper recovery. And of course, events have very much illustrated that. Um, and draw, you know, building on that to say, we know there is that this idea that there is a trade-off that, that, uh, and that economists believe you have to trade off the economy and GDP and output against some other woolly fuzzy things like being nice to people or um, ending poverty or saving the planet. That, those, that is not how the economy works. It is not how the world works. In fact, the, world, the way the world works is that if you get the broader policies right on um, climate change in this case, um, that will be good for the economy. If you get the broader policies right on inequality, that will be part of the economy. The, part, the economy is part of the system. It's part of us, not some separate thing that you have to trade off against. So Mieta, I'm going to throw another couple of questions into the mix at you just for more things to consider on this theme. So this is quite similar, but slightly more eccentric wording. Alan asked, to save us from the pandemic, uh, climate and environmental emergencies, we need continued economic recession to save us from the sixth extinction. What say you? So that's quite similar to what Jonathan was just talking about. And then Martin asked, how does repairing resilience and tackling inequality fit with green restructuring and investment? Because many voters will suspect that the first must come first. Yeah, so, uh, so very, very good questions. I'll, I'll take the sort of second one first because uh, the degrowth one is uh, is tricky. Uh, so I'll take the second one first. I mean, I think, you know, we've always argued um, that it, it's not, in it, the end, the climate crisis is a symptom of an economic model that's failed. And it's the same economic model that, by the way, is failing people and driving the living standard squeeze. Uh, and so the two things are not separate, they're fundamentally interlinked. Um, and in trying to achieve environmental justice, social justice has to sort of sit hand in glove with it. Um, but it won't happen organically and automatically. Um, and there is a genuine risk. And when you look at the, you know, we've done analysis that's looked across the country at what the kind of green transition, if you did it in an accelerated way would mean. And the communities that are struggling already are the ones that would be hammered by the green transition, unless you are active about putting in place policies to enable a just transition. And so for me, that is the single most thing. It requires deliberate policy, it requires industrial strategy, uh, it requires an active role for you know, governments at different levels, working with businesses, working with the communities to transition communities, transition businesses, transition industries, and critically for me, to people and their jobs from sectors of the past to sectors of the future. If you just leave it to happen, it will be a disaster. And critically, you won't win the consent that you need to win in order for us to have the, the level of change that climate change and responding to it is required and the pace of change that we're also need, that's also needed. And I think, again, there is huge amounts of political consensus on that, which is positive. The question is the how. Um, and one of the things I think we, we should, you know, furlough is a really interesting policy mechanism for me um, because the thing that is the successor to furlough, I think the government wants to kind of kill it and pretend it never happened <laughs> and never to be returned and end again. But the thing that potentially is a success of to furlough is something that allows you to have a combination of short-term part-time work, subsidized work that can be used to retrain people so that you can move them from sectors that are declining to sectors of the future. And you don't just dump them in the labor market and hope for the best. And we've got to start thinking about those sorts of policy interventions alongside what investment in places looks like, alongside industrial strategy to do the just transition piece really well. Um, so my big message is the two are not separate, but they won't happen without deliberate intervention, without deliberate policy. Um, I think that the, the question on the big debate on degrowth and growth, um, and what I would say is, 
in some respects, I think that's an old debate because I think what we're likely to see is that actually growth in advanced um, economies is about to plateau. Um, and I think we need to pivot the debate into actually growth cannot be the be end and end all. Um, you know, the, the way that I see it is that until about 10 years ago, you could make the argument that actually if you grew the economy, that's all you needed to do because trickle down meant that most people were lifted up. We've now had well over a decade where even in periods where we saw growth, the majority of people didn't benefit. So just tacking GDP and hoping for the best does not deliver the thing that in the end we all care about, which is how do you improve people's lives? How do you improve living standards? And if ever you were gonna make the argument for us tracking other indicators, you know, whether it's well-being, whatever you wanna call it, this is the moment because actually just tracking that thing, you can do it all you like. Some people might be all right, but a whole lot of people won't. And if you need any evidence of that, look at the last 10 years. So it feels like like never before we could win the argument that we need to move beyond growth. I don't think we need to be sort of litigating arguments about growth or degrowth. We need to just move beyond growth and think about what is it that we need to do to achieve well-being? What is it that we need to achieve other outcomes and indicators that in the end, that's what people care about because it's the thing that makes their lives better. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Annalisa, there's a question here about, are you considering a job guarantee, which has been endorsed by the New York Times, for instance? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there always are questions about, well, what does a job guarantee exactly mean? Um, we've seen the language of an opportunity guarantee, for example, being used even by the Conservatives, and yet they're not really guaranteeing anything. They're not, in fact, helping 99 out, sorry, 99 out of every 100 young unemployed people who qualify for their own kickstart scheme. So I think it's really important that when it comes to uh, intervention supporting people who've become unemployed, that they really are credible, that we're not talking about, you know, kind of Mickey Mouse schemes that won't help people. I do think, however, that we've got a lot of successful schemes from, indeed, previous Labour governments, also from Labour run Wales that we can be looking at around this, where there was an attempt to make sure that as much as possible, particularly young people could be guaranteed support. And it wasn't just around employment, it was also around access to training, for example, access to education as well. So not forcing people down a particular route, but really giving them that opportunity. I think that is very important and certainly you know, we've been very concerned by the, the failure of Kickstart until now. I've been ob obviously, as, as you would expect, working very closely with Johnny Reynolds around this, our shadow DWP uh, secretary. And, and we are um, going to be uh, ultimately announcing additional um, uh, measures in this regard over the days to come, because we are really concerned about particularly that failure for young people. You know, we know if they've been out of work for a long period, that can impact on them for the rest of their lives as well as having such a significant impact on them in the short term. What's your take on that proposal, Jonathan? And also you mentioned the Uber ruling uh, from last week. Um, has Sienna has frozen? <laughs> um, well, let me go ahead and uh, um, answer that um, anyway. Um, so, uh, uh, I mean, I think uh, in the context of the UK's you know, flexible labour market, where there are actually, um, up, up until the pandemic, there were really, really were plenty of jobs around um, for most people. I'm not sure a job guarantee is, is, is focusing on the right area of the problem, as opposed to trying to work out, you know, what do good jobs look like and what is the role of government in ensuring that everybody has the opportunity of getting a good job and a, 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 um, a, and a career. Um, and I think, you know, in some ways that would be my priority rather than talking about a job guarantee, what would a job guarantee actually mean in practice? Um, whereas um, ensuring that there are opportunity, that, that the jobs that, uh, that are there, as with, with Uber, um, are, uh, um, are good jobs that people have opportunities, that people have opportunities to train and retrain. And that leads into, well, what, what should we do about Uber? Well, I think those of us who are labor market economists or indeed experts in labor market regulation have been saying for at least the last 10 or 15 years that our model of employment regulation is fundamentally unsuited to deal with the, uh, uh, with the gig economy, uh, the sharing economy or whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, the 
government, the May government actually made a commendable attempt to address that with the Taylor review. Um, but then I think Matthew sort of copped out a bit of, uh, partly because of his terms of reference um, and what he thought was politically acceptable, didn't really come up with the radical solutions that were needed. And even the relatively moderate minor solutions that he proposed were, were not implemented by the government. And then of course, he's been sacked for no reason that any of us know. So there definitely is a gaping hole there in the government's uh, um, program. What does good job, what does good work look like? And what is role of government in, in ensuring that the private sector is able, willing, uh, able and willing to provide those good jobs? Thank you so much. Sorry that I just, my internet just randomly went down there. I should be asking, how do we get reliable internet from everyone so that Virgin Media doesn't just randomly go down? But anyway, um, Miata, if you'd like to talk about the job guarantee, the, the kind of Uber and gig economy stuff, but also people have been asking about kind of labor stance on the future of work generally. Labor stance on the future of Work. The future of work. Okay. <laughs> Still topic there. Um, so I, I agree. I agree with Jonathan. But actually, the the question now is the quality of the jobs that are being produced. Um, well, actually, that's not true. In the short term, I think there is a genuine issue around job creation. Um, and you know, best case scenario, we're looking at um, you know levels uh, of unemployment about seven point un unemployment about seven point five percent. It, worst case scenario, it could be higher than that. So I think there, there is definitely a job creation piece um, and supporting people with training it to get into those jobs. But, but the, the agenda for me in the next 10 years has to be about better quality jobs. And critically, it's got to be about security, uh, which speaks to the point about the gig economy, but actually even out with the gig economy, like getting to secure contracts for kids secure work, you know, ban to use the jargon, banning zero, zero hour contracts, that's, that, that has got to be bread and butter. But then that has to be in aligned uh, by, you know, how do we increase wages at every level? You know, we've had a decade of wage stagnation. We're about to see, you know, if the OBR's forecast is right uh, by 2024, 25, um, you know, wages are due to be down by 1,200 per person per year compared to where we were pre-pandemic after a decade in which they stagnated. I mean, that is incredible. And that's got to be something that has to be confronted. And you've got to do things at the bottom of the labor market. Uh, and, you know, for me thinking about actually how do we get proper living wage policy rather than minimum wage policy that we call living wage and how we drive that up. But I, I, I do think that there is also a contract of business and it's an, you're pushing at an open door because, you know, I've been really encouraged by, you know, where the big business associations from the CBI to the BCC to the FSBR, where they're saying, actually, going back to this point about a moment of change and a pivot, there's got to be a new social settlement. And we recognize that as businesses, you know, there is a new agenda. Now, whether you talk, you know, the language of reset in period 21, you know, there is a live debate about how do we how do we have social purpose within this? And I think that's something we've got to tap into because it is a, you know, the, the state can't just legislate for this. There also has to be a shift in the business model um, amongst businesses. And it seems that there is appetite for that. So how do you crystallize it? How do you enable that has to be a key part of this. Um, and, and for me, that's kind of core um, and center of whatever needs to happen. And that will require, uh, you know, a different framework or require le legislation. But, you know, I, I think there are parts of, you know, there's existing legislation that incentivizes businesses to operate in a particular way. So even businesses that want to shift will say, um, actually, you know, we've got to take our marching orders from our shareholders. Um, and those shareholders are often in other countries uh, offshore and they don't really care about the specifics in a particular community. Um, and actually changes to legislation um, around, uh, you know, uh, uh, around that would massively help us. Uh, so I do think we need to think about what the framework looks like that enables that. But for me, that's the piece. How do we get to just good, decent, well-paid jobs? Bread and butter. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, we've got so many questions here. We've got around hundred questions, but I'm just gonna uh, throw a few more sort of ideas um, at you all. So Adam Peggs asks, should public ownership of utilities or key industries play a role in Labour's new economic strategy? 
Um, and then another question is, as part of a future economic plan, what does future upskilling and retraining look like? So I know that Labour has been talking about that a lot, but what are the specifics of what it actually looks like? And then a final question from Sandy. Um, in 1942, beverages, five giant evils of want, disease, ignorance, squalor and idleness was key. Where are Labour's current evils? If you'd like to start us off, Annalisa. Yeah, sure. I mean, I might try and answer the um, the last question first, actually, because it, it does relate to the previous discussion, because I, I think that that issue about um, the growth of really poor quality, precarious work is absolutely fundamental right now. And, you know, I, I just I'm sorry, I'm being cheeky here because I wanted to give my top and worth on the overjudgment as, as well. But I do think it's very, very important that we identify the fact that we do have now a number of businesses whose model is not more efficient than other companies. Their model is based on exploitation, whether we're talking about exploitation of labor or we're talking about exploitation of tax rules that aren't working in the way that they should be. Ultimately, their model is, exploit is exploitative and we must see action against it. I mean, one judgment is great, but actually we need legislation. That's what we need to change this situation and of course, that must also involve ensuring that trade unions can play the parts that they need to in order to be um, uh, getting rid of the, this appalling practice. And, you know, I, I do think this is a big moral question. You know, I, I remember at the last uh, general election speaking to a delivery driver on the doorstep and she'd been asked to make over 100 deliveries in one day. She said she didn't have time to go to the toilet. She had a kidney infection previously because of not being able to do that. I think it's disgusting. We have that kind of practice in our economy right now. And I, I do think it's something that we've got to stamp out for the future, um, very obviously. Around um, uh, different key industries, I mean, obviously we're in a situation where actually the extent of state engagement in different industries has changed radically. You know, I agree with what um, Miata was saying uh, around this, around the role of government. You just think about public transport, for example, particularly rail where in practice there's now a very very heavy engagement of government and I think it's really important that actually we learn the lessons from what's taken place now I think it's really important that we do have much stronger public control I think that's important both for those services themselves but it's also important actually for that green transition when we're talking about energy uh, for example and then finally around um, upskilling and retraining uh, what does that look like um, well, I think we know what it shouldn't look like. It shouldn't be grafted on from on high, trying to provide outsourced solutions uh, to those skills challenges. Success tends to be delivered by very locally and regionally rooted approaches to this that build on what FE colleges are doing. They're making sure they've got the capacity to deliver in this. Actually having those networks then between those colleges, local authorities, local employers, and local trade unions, not of course, uh, closing the Union Learning Fund, which is a completely vindictive and retrograde step, pulling those together and providing that capacity is going to be far more effective than having a completely you know, nationally driven, centralised approach, which unfortunately, for example, is what looks like it's going to be used for uh, the restart scheme, which will not actually be helping people who need that upskilling and retraining. Jonathan, would you like to briefly pitch in in terms of uh, upskilling and retraining, what that looks like, the five giant evils uh, and public ownership? Well, I mean, I think the, the five giants are actually pretty much the ones that we still should be most focused on, right? Want, squalor, ignorance, you know, improving education, improving the, the making sure the benefit system lifts people out of poverty, um, uh, improving the, the quality of our and quantity of our housing stock, all of those are challenges which are still very much with us. Um, so, uh, um, you know, of course, they take somewhat different forms. And I guess I would apply that to uh, nationalization as well, actually, that the challenges remain the same, but even if the answers are different, um, you know, uh, the nationalization was a, a strategy designed to respond to the fact that the commanding heights, the key strategic sectors that shaped the economy um, were in the hands, it was perceived, of private monopolies. Now, regardless of whether that was true or not at the time or whether it was 
um, the right response or how it was done, um, it seems to me to be slightly odd, shall we say, to suggest that the water sector, whatever you think of how it's run, is a commanding hydro or strategic sector. Um, we could probably stop our water bills ripping us off so much, but nationalizing it does not seem to me to be a big deal or a big priority. It doesn't really change the structure of the economy. What are the commanding hydro of the economy that you worry about now? They are Facebook, Amazon, et cetera. Um, so any, you know, if you want to address those challenges, and I'm not saying we should nationalize Facebook necessarily, but if we want to grapple with those challenges, then you know, we should be spending a lot, lot more time worrying about what we do about Facebook or Apple than we should worrying about what we do about water, to be absolutely frank. It really is a sort of second or third order issue by comparison. Um, on, um, you know, retraining and upskilling, well, I, I mean, this is something that the successive governments have grappled with for a very long time. I think Annalise's comments are broadly correct, actually. You can't do this from the top down. You have to find systems mechanisms that that actually respond to local needs and oddly enough ironically we're actually rather better at doing that in the 1980s than we are now thank you so much mieta uh, so just briefly so i'll hone in on the uh, ownership question because uh, so i take a slightly different view because i do think that there are certain sectors that are foundational and they're foundational because they offer key things that we need to survive. So, you know, water, uh, transportation, our heat, our energy, and it's really important that they work for the public. And we know that in those markets, they are fundamentally broken markets because they're not particularly competitive. They're still in the hands of a few players. Um, and sometimes it works for the public, but a lot of times that it doesn't. Um, and so I do think there is a question um, about ownership, but I, I don't believe that ownership needs to be through big national bureaucracies and institutions. And actually, I think we need to be thinking about ownership at a far more kind of localized level and whether that is about municipal ownership um, of parts of the infrastructure, uh, community ownership, the key thing is how do you put the public in charge? Because they've got to work in the interest of the public. Um, th there might be other kinds of uh, models that you put in place, whether it's kind of cooperative, but you know, run by a particular um, organization for me, they are so foundational to our existence, you know, to our day-to-day -day living, that we just need to make sure that they are always working in the public interest. And then the mechanism by which you do that, I don't think should be the old model of nationalization, uh, which had its <laughs> failing some flaws. I think there are new interesting models that we can be thinking about at different levels. And I think the same goes for the kind of green economy, you know, if, if the level of investment that's required to unlock it plays out, we must be thinking about how that translates into ownership of the key infrastructure and assets by people in their communities uh, so that they own it, but they also benefit from the upside of it. I think that's got to be part um, of the proposition. Um, but, you know, we, we haven't mentioned the words devolution or power in whatever is done uh, in the economic strategy and indeed in the way that we think about some of these solutions, we have got to move away from the top-down model. And for me, nationalization kind of speaks to that model. Um, you know, there might be artillery things where that makes sense, but we need to be thinking about how we locate uh, the wherewithal, the resources, um, uh, and indeed the ownership at levels below national level as well. Thank you so much. I think we're coming to the end of the event now, and I'm so grateful to you all for giving such beautifully eloquent and concise answers. And I think we got through a lot of questions there. So I'm pretty pleased with uh, how that went. And I think uh, everyone should be satisfied that we gave it a really good go of getting through those questions as well. Um, Thank you so much to our, our panelists, Miata, Jonathan, and Annalisa. I know that, Annalisa, you've got a really big week ahead. You've got a couple of big speeches coming up. So everyone look out for news of those on Labour List and watch out for our next event with UK in a changing Europe. There'll be another one soon. Thank you so much for joining our event.